the hope that each of us has to build a new world order in which nations and peoples with different systems and different values can live together in peace. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. Now we can see a new world coming into view, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order can emerge. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used I think only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. There's a need for a new world order. In the next few years, a solution will emerge that people will look into that cauldron and decide that they have to learn the elements. But I think that at the end of this administration, with all its turmoil, and at the beginning of the next, we might actually witness the creation uh, of a new uh, order. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. It is a new mindset that the world now needs. It is a real global new deal that we need, an ecological and an economic new deal that we need in the name of France. I call upon all states to join ranks in order to found the new world order of the 21st century. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. We need a world of shared global rules founded on shared global values. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. The new world order essentially is an agenda. It's a plan to unite the world into one, whether it be one world government, one world cash system, one world religion. Um, it's all about uniting everything into one. They call it the new world order, and that's what they're trying to create. Essentially different power blocks from around the world decide to get together and agree to carve it up amongst themselves with a system where they all profit and the whole world is fooled into believing something else. This idea of a globalization or a global uh, totalitarian uh, political scheme where uh, the masses are regulated and controlled uh, by the few is nothing new in society. It goes back millennia. This has been a common theme of those who seek to profit us and to uh, oppress us and to hold us in checks and balances. Pick up letters from Henry Kissinger where he plans for a one world government, where he talks about an outside threat, whether fake or real, using it as a way to scare the people so they accept and love the new world order.
North American Union that can help them move into a global economic system, a global political world, where they can destroy all borders, where there will be no Mexican border, no Canadian border, but we'll all be under a world system. Then you're looking at world domination type stuff, and I, you know, I don't, I think, I think there's too much diversity in the world to do that. It comes down to the bottom line, which is money. Those who have the gold want to keep it, tend to. They're not, they don't want to lose power. It's about power and economics, yeah. yeah. Economic crisis, you, you see it now as, yeah, on a global level. The first time people are talking about global regulation of markets, right? Because of economic crash. So somebody has to be shot before you notice that the weapon is dangerous. How about global government down the road? What about that idea? Oh man, I work for that. I, I, I work in that and uh, um, you, have to, you have to make it up to 190 countries. Uh, it's a long process. Well, the globalization is ve inevitable. Pero pienso que más que en el mercado nos está afectando también culturalmente. Eh, se están perdiendo muchas tradiciones y pues ahora ya casi en todo el mundo escuchamos el mismo tipo de música. Este, las tradiciones pues se están perdiendo porque estamos nosotros absorbiendo las de otros países. Well, the end game is it's not going to stop with the North American Union. It's going to be one further step along the road to one world government. Already, as we speak, the uh, nations of Africa are uh, contemplating an African Union. In fact, uh, they, had, uh, they made a fairly large step forward in 2007 with a summit. Speaking at the event, Ambassador Saeed Jinnit, AU Commissioner for Peace and Security, called the launch an historic moment in the partnership between the U.S. and the AU. He said the African Union is determined to pursue the path of continental integration with the support of its partners. Of course, we already have the European Union. Uh, a similar movement is afoot in, uh, in Southeast Asia and also South America. So once you have a North American Union, that'll merge with uh, the European Union, that'll eventually merge with Africa. So these four, five, six major trading blocks will all come together uh, as, as one world government. There is a, uh, an organization you can find on the internet, and they also are in touch and they want a common currency for the world as a whole. And Robert Mundell has uh, an annual conference in this place in Italy where we discuss these issues. But uh, my view is that uh, this is totally premature. The first step would be to have regional monetary unions, like say one in the Caribbean, one for Central America, one for uh, South uh, America. And once they have been established and they see all the benefits that come from it and that it is manageable, that the problem of losses of national monetary sovereignty do not appear or seem to be very small, then you can have these regional unions getting together and reaching agreement to stabilize the exchange rates amongst themselves. I believe that there is an opportunity now with the G20 having been, having been called for the first time for us to put together a global steering committee of all the great powers of the world. If I was asked what is the single most important thing that can be done to get us out of this mess, it is going to be to recognize now that we are one common humanity, divided perhaps into economic entities all countries. The time has come for us to work together. Do you think it's possible down, somewhere down the road to see a, a North American Union that might merge into some sort of a global governing body? <laughs> One world government? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't see the likelihood of, of establishing a North American Union in our lifetimes. I don't think that the people in any of the three countries want to dissolve their government in favor of a single government. Moving to, you know, global governance dealing with, you know, political and other things, I, I don't see it, quite frankly. I think that we are struggling already with our global institutions, such as the United Nations. We're trying to find a way, you know, mm -hmm. to deal with uh, 
situations that arrive uh, uh, from time to time in the world where we've got, you know, you've got a, you know, where the global community thinks maybe national sovereignty is not such a good thing. If you think that your government in Ottawa or Washington is somewhat distant and unresponsive, imagine how uh, distant and unresponsive it's going to be if uh, our government is now situated, uh, let's say, in The Hague, uh, in the Netherlands, or in Rome, or some other place uh, that might be the seat of a one-world government. We're not.